Good evening, everyone, again. I just wanted to uh, so apologize for the little technical difficulty we have. I just want to make sure, can everybody hear me now? And can you just type in the message so I know for sure that you can hear? And the sound is okay? Just give us a thumbs up, a like, a message, anything. Don't send in a bottle. It'll take too long. Just <laughs> type it in the chat, please. And everyone can hear. Seems like it's okay. Let me know. Yes? Okay. Gonna go ahead. So I shall quickly summarize what I said earlier. Um, thank you so much for joining us again. My name is Lisa. I'm with the programming team of the Arts House. I'd like to quickly introduce Christine from Tusitala Books, who is our partner in crime with this project, and the wonderful writer who took on this chance uh, of a project uh, to go on this journey with us, Sufyan Hakim. Yay! Thank Hi, you. <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, so the if you uh, I hope that you everybody took that little bit of a break to kind of read a little bit more about the project and read the story so we can have a great discussion about it tonight. Um, I just want to go into how we actually came up with the idea for this project in the first place. When the circuit breaker happened and everyone was in lockdown, we were we could see that sort of like the theater groups were doing something different, uh, music groups and dance groups, and we wanted to think about how can, you know, those of us who program in the literary arts, how can we do something for our audience that is a little bit different and engaging and something that we can work with our writers on that will get them excited as well and still stay connected with the audience. And so I had a little chat with Christine, whom we had just worked with uh, during Textures, our our festival in March that celebrates Singapore literature because Tusitala is really great in always searching for new ways to tell stories. and. While we did something, you know, really like VR with them doing textures and high tech, uh, high tech for us, uh, she suggested something really much more old school, and that was actually going back to the serial short story, which you know happened in the time of Dickens and even before Dickens, there was this idea of serial sort of writing, uh, and I thought that's great. And then how we can maybe involve the audience is while it's happening every week. We can engage them. Did you like that? Did you do you think there should be another character? So they can get involved by commenting on the story and helping it kind of unfold and working together, you know, with the writer in that way. So crowdsourcing. Um, and just to preface, all of this is really an experiment. If you had been following us from the start, which we really hope uh, that you have, and thank you if you have, we've changed platforms along the way, uh, timings. Uh, I think uh, we even talked about changing the day, which we sort of do our live AMAs, really just to find the best way um, to reach the audience and, you know, obviously what's comfortable for the writer as well. Uh, so this is, um, it was a four week program for those who may not be aware of it. And each week we would have a draft of the story put up. Uh, and then after that, we would ask um, the audience is to vote on, you know, should it be this thing that happens next or this, uh, should there be this character and really just kind of getting people to get excited. Um, I mean, I've had um, a lot of fun doing this whole project and I really hope that both of you have as well. And just a reminder, if at any point anyone has any questions or comments, please put it in the chat and we'll definitely, you know, pick it up and talk about it a little bit later. Uh, so, Sufian, I hope you had a great time working on this and I really I'd like to invite you to read maybe your favorite section of what's been written so far. Definitely I had, I had a wonderful time doing this. Um, I think I mean as a writer I, I love to directly interact with my readership and for them to contribute towards writing a story towards crafting a story is the most amazing experience ever so thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I would like to read from um, chapter three um, of the house next door. We, um, when we first thought of like writing a story, thought of like, you know, crowdsourcing a story, um, I veered towards my favorite genre, horror. Um, I, horror fascinates me. It, it triggers my imagination. Um, and I really wanted to see how, um, a collection of different things that horrify different people can come together in a story. Um, I mean, there are specific things that scare me, there are specific things that scare you, and there are specific things that scare the people who contributed towards um, the serial short story project. 
Um, so with that, I'd like to read from chapter 3, one of my favourite chapters, because we introduced the monster. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> okay, at this point, the siblings, Jason and Jasmine, have entered the house next door, and they hear a mysterious sound. We should get out of here, said Jason. No, we need to figure out who's been doing this, Jasmine says stubbornly. She pointed her phone to the adjacent room. She's carrying up the phone torch. Um, hello, we know you're in here. Come out. Come out. There's nobody in here, said her brother. But Jasmine seemed angry. Hello, whoever you are, can you explain this God-forsaken circle to us? Jason pulled his sister's hand. Just let it go. Maybe it's a very unfortunate coincidence. They, this must have been here for months or years. Let's just go home and have some ice cream and watch TV. There's someone here, Jasmine insisted. She gave the circle a wide buff as she walked towards... Oh, sorry. There's a circle in the middle of the living room um, that contains effigies that look like them. So she gave the circle a wide buff as she walked towards what would have been the, the house's kitchen. There was a small dining table there, the kind with a circular wooden top and foldable metal legs that they used in coffee shops. There was a raised platform where the cupboards and countertops should have been, but they had been stripped bare. The windows, as with everything everywhere else in the house, were bottled up with thick, sturdy planks. The sink and a rotten wooden under-sink cabinet were the only things still in place. Hello? Jasmine called out again. Jason could feel his heart beating faster. This felt wrong and dangerous. Hello? There was a response, but it was unmistakable. It was that animalistic growl he had heard the night before. Jasmine was first to respond. There, under the sink, she yelled, striding past her brother to the other end of the kitchen. This bastard thinks he can hide from us. She opened the cabinet door. A truly hideous thing fell out. It seemed human. It was humanoid in shape, but it was flayed, and the red, bleeding, boiling flesh was bumpy and uneven, and seemed to writhe with a life of its own. Its head had just one feature. Eyes. Eyes where the mouth should be, eyes where the nose should be, and eyes in between. There was an eye that looked upon Jason with bloodlust. There was an eye that looked at him with a manic hunger. There were eyes that looked at Jasmine, and there were eyes that looked up and down, and left and right. There were eyes that looked through them. The thing moaned. A sound that nature and life could never make. It crawled to them. Its legs was a gnarled, maimed thing, bent at odd angles. Its flayed hands ended in claws, crimson as death. Jasmine and Jason yelled, their minds unable to fathom the thing before them. So that was from chapter three. Um, if you want to read the rest of the chapter as well as the rest of the story, um, I think the link uh, should be in the Facebook Live. So go check it out. Um, it was really a, a fantastic crowdsourced thing. Um, some of these ideas weren't things that I came up with. It was, it was, you know, it was inspiration from from all of you who contributed to the Serial Short Story Project. Um, yeah. Sorry, so uh, Lisa, what should I... Um, yeah, so Fan, you had sort of some slides or something you wanted to sort of take us through, right? Yes, okay. So, um, yeah. Um, firstly, I want to kind of share and maybe give a shout out to people who contributed to the story. Um, I'm not... I, we don't have the time to mention all of you here, but there are some people I really want to um, highlight. Um, first is Kari Cry, who um, was the first person to vote. So on week two of the of the program, we had a vote about what Jason's um, nightmare should be. So in chapter two, he has a nightmare, and it kind of foreshadows what's going to happen, as well as set the theme, um, set the themes for um, uh, for the story, um, what kind of ideas and, and, and themes I want to explore. Um, so Kari Cry voted for Tree, um, and she goes on to explain uh, what dreams, what what having, what dreaming about food um, speaks about your emotional state. 
So she was saying that to eat bad tasting food in your dreams indi- indicates some sourness or resentment in your emotions to your mind. To see or eat burnt food in your dreams suggests that you're experiencing some intense emotion. Um, the dream may also indicate that you're feeling exhausted and you're running out of fuel. And to see fake or plastic food in your dream implies that you're not getting the emotional support you're looking for. You're feeling emotionally unsatisfied. Um, which is fantastic because um, I wanted um, I wanted the dream. The story to me was a lot about two people, these two kids who moved to a, to a house in Yishun and, you know, and um, um, after their, their dad loses his business due to the pandemic and they had to move from their luxury condominium to a small, um, run-down old Yishun flat. So for me, it was also, I wanted to explore the idea of losing your innocence through this. Um, and, and the dream I wrote there was a there was really a amalgamation of so many ideas that you guys came off uh, with. Um, was that he dreamt of eating ice cream, something innocent, something a child would do, but then somebody steals the, the ice cream and the ice cream just mutates and grows to something um, something chaotic and and with uh, with sentience, but not the kind that we usually not life as we know it, you know. And the, so this blob of ice cream grew eyes all over. Uh, and to me, eyes are both um, a case of being seen uh, as well as looking at something. So seeing your sins and having your sins seen, seeing your guilt and your loss of innocence as well as having it seen. So there was, um, so all, the, the idea of eyes was very important to me, which is why it appeared in the ice cream dream, and which is why it's such a um, it's such a central feature to the to the monster we created. Um, of course, a few more shout outs, uh, Tang Tzu Yun. Um, who says that I think I'd be freaked out if I uh, if there were photos of my family or myself and my family being laid in the circle, which is which um, inspired me for the idea of the effigies being representations of them, um, as if it was part of some sacrifice. Exactly, um, Jolene again about a dream. Uh, dreams are often a reflection of someone's emotions and how they are processing reality. Um, and I totally, totally agree with you, Jolene Alexandra, um, which is why I took that and, and really decided to create a dream that's not just to like add to the horror for the sake of it, but um, to really play the themes and, and, and the emotional state um, of our characters. Uh, and of course, uh, to my wife, Shelby, I think she has contributed a lot to this and she has been a central process to the whole writing thing. So Shelby, I love you. And you have been a central part of my writing process, as always. Yeah. Um, okay, but from all this, I mean, all of you contributed so many things to, to, to the process. Um, but ultimately, the foundation for all of this was really my influences, my what I wanted to write and, and the story I wanted to bring across. So I wanted to share with you guys some of the some of my influences and the thought process that went into writing the story. So Vanessa, I keep my slides. The slides should appear soon. Are they, are they out? Vanessa, I can present. Can, do I present? Should I, should I present? Yes, I, she says, go ahead. Okay, so I'll present for my for myself. Yeah. Begotten, okay. you see, begotten. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. What a horrible okay. picture. <laughs> okay. All right. No, but it's fantastic. Okay. So, um, I want to share with you guys some of my influences, and one of the first things that scared me visually. Okay. No, I since young I was I loved watching horror movies. So after a while, you know, you get desensitized, right? So it takes quite a bit to um to really shock or horrify me. Um, and one of the things, um, one of the first things that scared me as a young adult um, was Elias' marriage, uh, marriages um, Begotten. So Begotten was, is a very symbolic uh, experimental film, uh, May 1989. Um, so what he does is he double, so, th- so he takes the negative of the, so he shot on film to the negative, then to the negative of the negative. And and and, uh, and played out. So like every minute of um, and this was before digital. Uh, so every minute of screen of, of footage took like eight hours to create. Anyway, begotten was a um, 
it's a very symbolic story that took influences from um, from Christianity as well as the ancient Egyptian religion um, to to tell the story of um, of well, Genesis. Um, if you if you follow the Abrahamic religions or you know the origin of the world um, in, in in this case ancient Egyptian mythology. So um, we have like um, we have divine beings. I'm not going to say which ones represent what because that might you know cause a stir. But we have divine beings um, who um, destroy themselves to make way for other divine beings, um, and and so the idea of the divine parent, you know, making way for the divine children, what the parent has to give up such that the children will thrive. That was essential. That was essential theme um, to this to to be gotten. Um, and, and I like that. I like the fact that, um, I like how macabre that storyline is and how sad it is in a certain way. Um, I mean, the visuals were, were horrifying, but the story itself was pretty sad, um, that, that the divine parents have to make way, you know? Um, and so similarly in the story, I want to explore the sins of the father and how the children have to deal with it. I mean, we don't we didn't get to explore it in its entirety in the short story, but I think we laid the foundation for it. Next slide. When it came to um, coming up with a monster, that was a uh, um, for me that that required a bit of research because, like I said, I'm I'm desensitized, so um, I wanted to really find a monster that <laughs> nice, nice emoji. Um, sorry, uh, Vanessa, next slide, please. Is it me? Okay. Yes, it's so, up. Yes. All right. So the next, um, the next group of influences for, I mean, the next big influence for me when it comes to horror is the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, H.P. Lovecraft is fantastic. Uh, if you guys love horror, you guys need to start there. He influenced Clive Barker, Stephen, uh, Stephen King. Um, he basically is the, the godfather of modern, of modern horror. Um, H.P. Lovecraft um, excelled in cosmic horror. So horror that is misshapen, and not horror that is organic but not natural. Horror that the human mind cannot naturally process. Um, so, I mean, you guys heard of Cthulhu and all that, and... and and yeah, we see the pictures of Cthulhu being, you know, um, huge tentacle monsters. Um, but during his time, um, they were, he, I mean, it, he, they were very unspeakable horrors. Um, so a lot of artists have tried, some have failed, some have done very well, um, have tried to recreate Lovecraft's monsters because he describes them very vaguely. Um, but the one thing that always stuck out when it came, when it came to his monsters were the fact that they, they had natural elements in that um, there were parts of the monsters that occur in, in nature that we, can, we have seen as human beings, but at the same time mixed in such a way that was, um, that was truly horrifying, that, that, that the human mind cannot process and fathom. Um, which is why, um, in the end, it, it came to be a monster that was full of eyes. Um, both for thematic reasons as well as for the fact that it's something natural, but at the same time super natural. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, <laughs> by the way, just, just to pop in, Shimin asked about uh, reconciling Lovecraft's basically with his work. Um, watch Lovecraft Country, I think it, it's a very nuanced exploration of of um, how um, of of the conflict between Lovecraft's ideas and his racism. Um, he was a great man. He was a good man. Uh, he he accomplished many things. But you know, um, I think uh, I can separate the work from the author. Um, if he was alive right now, I wouldn't be. Uh, I wouldn't condone what he what he does, what he did. Sorry, but um, but he had some really amazing ideas that that push forward the idea of horror um, and how we express it in today's art and culture. Okay, um, finally, finally, my biggest influence when it comes to monsters is John Carpenter. Uh, I'm going to use the thing here because it's the most uh, 
is the most popular example. Um, John Carpenter is the master of body horror. Um, so basically what he does is, it's, it's again like, he was inspired by Lovecraft as well. So it's the idea that something is organic and natural, but at the same time, not in a very horrific way. So you see the, the, the images here. <laughs> um, if you see the images here, it's, yeah, you see heads, you see tendrils, you see tentacles, you see hands, but they are misshapen and, you know, and, um, and joined in a very unnatural way. So what, what he was, a, he was an amazing pioneer in, uh, in the field of horror and, and you know, I can't, um, uh, sorry, when I here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so he was, he was an amazing pioneer in the, in the field of horror and, uh, and when it came to monsters, he was my first go-to person when it came to try to craft something. So those were my influences when it came to creating this, this, this monster of ours. Um, next slide, please. So all these ideas came together to me, um, in my head, along with the, along with the contributions of all the, um, the readers in the Steel Short Story Project. Um, and, and what we came up with was, was that, the, the clawed, tall, slender, humanoid thing with eyes all over its head, um, whose intentions we, you know, we can't quite fathom and, and, uh, who has very strange, um, connections with, with, um, narrow limb, John and, uh, just, so Jason and Jasmine's father, but, um, at this point we haven't, uh, put this all in yet. Okay. Sorry. So for my final, um, influence. Okay. So those are my influences for creating the monster, but when it came to the story, um, I think I drew inspiration also from the Haunting of Hill House. Um, the Haunting of Hill House, both the Netflix, well, both the Netflix, uh, mainly the Netflix um, series, but also Shirley Jackson's novel. Um, it was the idea that ghosts were representative of our own inner demons. Um, and I think that's my favorite kind of ghost. I don't, I, I mean, I don't appreciate ghost stories where the ghosts are just ghosts for the heck of it, you know, um, just to provide jump scares. Um, that, that doesn't work for me. So for me, the ghosts or demons or monster has to be, um, has to feed the theme of the story. Um, and that's what I was looking for. Um, so like, for example, in the Haunting of Hill House, um, you have, um, you have the pen neck lady, for example, right? Which is, um, for those of you who don't know who is, one, one of the protagonists, she kills, she kills herself. Um, that's debatable, but she kills herself and, and she snaps her neck. We then discovered that throughout her childhood, she has seen, she has, uh, she had visions of this bent neck lady. Um, so basically, so it's basically her younger self seeing her older self, her death. Um, and, and the character's story is that she, um, is that her own big, her own biggest enemy is self, her own, um, the only person who can stop her, the only person who, who, who um, you know, who prevents her from, from becoming a strong person from, from overcoming her demons is herself. Um, and so it's thematic that the thing that has been haunting her all this while is actually just her. Um, so yeah, so similarly, um, I wanted the idea of eyes as, um, the ability to see, um, I think, uh, Jason and Jasmine's father has been, um, doing what he's been doing unseen he's been able to keep a secret for so long um and this monster represents um the guilt that he has for what he has to do as well as his family's failure to see him for who he really is next slide please by the way um give a heart if you guys love the haunting of hill house one of my favorite series uh, in recent history um yeah so this is what this like to come up. Sorry. I, okay. Um, so we've covered the, how we came up, how I came up with the monster. I've we've covered how, um, I've approached writing the story. Um, uh, finally, it's all about localization. Um, I think we, I mean, I have all these influences and we would, we were all, um, all the contributors, as well as me, as well as the people from the arts house at Tusitala, uh, we all have been trying to craft this story, but ultimately it's about writing a Singaporean ghost story. 
Um, so I, um, so to research, I did a lot of like research on, on local and regional ghost stories. So you, have, you can see there, there's the, there's the Toyo, um, there's the Penangal, which is um, a head that's been detached from the body that's on the top right hand side the, uh, of, of the slide. And then, you know, there's Pontianas and there's the Pochong. So these are, so, you know, local horror, sh horror stories um, uh, carry a certain flavor with it. Um, I think, you know, the Western, Western horror traditions have like uh, Gothic horror as well as um, uh, Victorian horror. Um, and I wanted to really bring it home, um, you know, despite my influences. Um, so we, so there were very, there were quite a few attempts throughout the four chapters to really localize all this. Yeah, I think that's my last slide. Is that my last slide, Vanessa? Yes, it is. Uh, okay. Thanks so much, Sufian. I mean, that was quite an education for someone who is kind of not really into horror because I'm a bit of a scaredy cat and I'd be watching it with my eyes closed. <laughs> well, then um, I, recommend, I recommend The Haunting of Hill House because it's family drama plus horror. Uh, I just going to ask you, on a scale of 1 to 10, how scary is Lovecraft Country? Um, okay, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, Lovecraft Country is... Okay, so it's a range, okay? If you're watching it purely for the horror, I say it's a 6. If you're watching it as a person who wants to understand the nuances of racism, it's a 12. Because um, the, the protagonist... Uh, scale. Yeah, the protagonists are, are black people in Jim Crow America. Mm. So the horror, the horror that, that gets them isn't just, you know, Shoggoths and all the other monsters of Lovecraft, but also white America and its racism. Um, so yeah, so a range. So if you're just watching it just for the horror, it's a six. But um, for a nuanced understanding of racism, I think it's a 12. Yeah. I'm also a wimp, so maybe a six is like a 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think we, we've had a plethora of questions, wonderful, uh, from the chat, but just to let everyone know, we're also going to be polling you guys, and we have three different questions that we're going to poll you guys as well, so just look out for that, um, for the sort of FB poll feature thing. Um, so Christine, do you want to sort of bring in some of the questions that have been coming up? Yeah, I, I think we have quite a few yeah. interesting questions. Uh, I think one of the questions from uh, Sean Teo is, is there a compelling reason why you had to relate this story to COVID? Uh, mm -hmm. your, stand, your story itself stands very well, even without the association. Um, yeah, okay, agreed. Um, but I wanted to kind of really uh, make it topical. Um, I wanted to find a very topical way, very relevant way of, of of uh, creating the situation in which the family has to move from their condo to the uh, house in Yishun. Uh, I mean, businesses can, can go bust um, at any time, but I think it was a nice flavor for me that uh, it happened during the COVID uh, situation. So I think it was just a, a matter of being topical and relevant rather than, uh, rather than specifically um, having COVID central to the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I think when 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 we first started this project, it's all, it was very COVID related also. So maybe that yeah. also kind of influenced the way you started thinking about the story. Exactly. I mean, isn't the reason why this project exists? <laughs> <laughs> in a in a way, yes. I mean, yes. <laughs> Lisa talked about have being inspired. I think I was very inspired by what Google was doing in Australia with some of the theatre companies where you would actually watch a theatre show live and you could actually vote on and influence what the actor could do. So I, I, that was. Yeah, it was really quite COVID. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we have another quite interesting question from Shimin, who is going to be our next writer. Yes. She's probably planning, you know, <laughs> asking this question to help her as she does her next story. So she's asking how much planning went into your story. I guess that's the thing with a crowdsource thing, right? How much can you plan in advance? And then how much of your story changes along the way yeah. as each interaction happens during the week? Exactly, yeah. So, so for me, there was... There were very, I had, I had a story in mind, characters in mind, and like certain plot points I wanted to reach. But the in betweens, that was just, that was a blank slate for me because I wanted that to to come alive. I wanted it to be formed during the process of the discussion. Um. So yeah. So for me, it was it was the knowledge that okay, eventually they're gonna go to the house next door. Jasmine will pick the lock. Then their father will come out of nowhere. But is it to save them or is it because he's in cahoots? You know, so so the in-betweens were just like 
um, it formed um, organically from the discussions. Uh. Yeah, amazing process. I really loved it. I, I really love the fact that that you know we're discussing. Uh, I'm a scriptwriter by like that's my job. So like we're always in the writer's room. So that process is really enjoyable to me. Um, the idea that you know you're just bouncing ideas off each other and like you know just talking about things that that inspire you or, or hit you or, or things that make you feel a certain way and then just sharing it with the entire group. That's an amazing process for me. Okay, that's cool. I think we still have a few questions, but maybe it's a good time for us to go into the first poll. Um, so this is going to be a Facebook poll where you can actually vote on the options that um, our wonderful moderator is going to put up. So the question is, um, let us know what was your favourite part of the story. Uh, we have four options. If your favourite part of the story is not within these four options, please feel free to put in the chat. So the first option is uh, abandoned HD flat. <laughs> Second option is the ritual circle. Uh, third option are the small effigies on the floor. And then the fourth option is the multi eye monster. <laughs> yes. I'm quite curious to know what everybody prefers. I have a very strong preference. I don't know about Lisa and Sufian. <laughs> I voted already, so. <laughs> you voted for your own thing? Okay, I also want to vote. Hold on. <laughs> on. I think it might have been the effigies for me. Mm. Hey, 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 you're not supposed to buy <laughs> the vote. I feel like no, no, you voted the vote. <laughs> I think it's uh it's about a one minute or uh, thirty second vote. So I think you uh everybody who is watching now, please vote and let us know what was your favorite part of the story. Actually, Sufian, I think you're more known actually for your novels. Was this your first uh short story, and and what was that experience like for you? Because um, you know you had a, a time crunch that we gave you, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually have. Uh, actually, the first award I ever won for, for writing was a short story. Um, it was the Esquire Singapore Mont Blanc ah. short story um, um, award prize. Well, those, yeah, uh, and, and I, I submitted a reimagining of the Sang Nal Tama story. So, you know how like cool. before he reached Singapore, he threw off his crown overboard, right? <laughs> so, and then that was in the storm and then he threw his crown overboard and then the seas were calm. So, in this one, he threw the thing that that gave him his true power, which is his legacy. So he chose his son. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's always been a darkness in you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but my favourite short story to write uh, <laughs> was was another contribution for um, Esquire Singapore. It's called Who's Your Daddy? Slash Siapa Bapak Kau. Which is Who's Your Daddy in Malay. Hmm. So it explores sexuality through the lens of language. Like, you know, who's your daddy in English is a, it's a, it's a, there's sexual, con there's a sexual connotation, right? Yes. But in Malay, it's, it's quite a sad thing. And, and it's a regularly sad thing, but it's a sad thing, like, because you, know, you don't know who your father is. Interesting. Yeah. So, so it was, it was the same scene. Um, so I wrote it par in parallel paragraphs. It was the same scene. One is, you know, the girl being asked who's your daddy bisexually and the girl being asked who's your daddy Okay, I think I think the results are out. The results are in. It's a tie. Oh no! Okay, what's, what's Oh, that? I didn't vote. I should have voted. Then the effigies would have won. <laughs> it's a tie between uh, the effigies and the monster. Dang <laughs> it! Okay. Now, I mean, for me, it was also, also the effigies. Like, I was like, wow. Like, I was telling Sufia when I first read it, my skin literally crawled and I felt cold <laughs> and creeped out. Even though I was in a very crowded place. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I mean, sorry, go on. Oh, I guess for me, it's because it's something more like you might see it other than like a, you know, multi-eyed monster. You're much more likely to see someone who's done some effigy thingy on the floor with a circle of rice or something around it. That's a fair point, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think that that was kind of what uh, made it scary for me because, you know, there was an element that that actually could happen. Mm. Um, I used to be very frightened of the idea of voodoo. Mm. So, I, I mean, I'm sure, like, uh, effigies and all this, they come from the same, uh, you know, um, brand of magic, I guess. Uh, in that, you know, clay or wooden representations of you can have power on the actual you, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so so the idea of effigies really scared me, especially the fact that it's in a it's in a ritualistically created circle. Yeah. Um yeah and so yeah that was a that was a scary scary thing for me, but I voted monster. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah I think 
we have another two questions. So I think we can maybe do it a, a little bit quickly. Okay. So the second question is about the title. So I think the way we, we came up with the title is, is very different from a regular pros writing process, right? So usually, uh, the writer will write the story and then maybe the title will emerge subconsciously or something like that. But for this one, we had to commit to a title in advance, uh, even before you knew where the story would be going. So, I mean, I'm just curious to know, and I think we'll put it in the poll, whether the, the readers feel that this title is still suitable or whether it should be changed. And if you feel it should be changed, why don't you think? Why don't you think of a best sexy alternative that we can consider? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, titles are generally very important in the book trade, or even like yeah. writing a short story, or even like watching Netflix. Right? Within five seconds, you see the title. There are certain connotations that you like. You know, um, there are certain kind of vibe that you get, and then you decide whether or not you even want to click on it to find out more. So yeah, what do you guys think about this title and what are some sexier <laughs> alternatives that you would like to propose? Actually, and Sophia, I mean for you, how, what, what do you think about, you know, it, it was kind of like a reverse process. How, how, how anchored do you feel to the title as you were writing the story? Um, I want to tell you the truth now that for most stories that I write, I write the story first and then the title comes to me in the process. So this was, this was quite, you know, um, I'm glad that, you know, it's the house next door. So it's, um, it speaks to what the story is going to be without, um, you know, and in such a way that doesn't limit what I'm going to, you know, um, what I'm going to write about. For example, if the title was, say, Rosemary's Pregnancy, then I know I'm limited already. I think that's <laughs> pregnancy, right? But uh, it's Rosemary, Rosemary or, so not Yeah, you need else. a character named Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> Which you don't know. Know. Which baby. <laughs> the horror movie. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, like, uh, the, I'm glad that it was, it was a title that, that's open enough, but hints at, at some form of mystery. Um, so yeah, so so I'm I'm blessed. I, I I'm glad that we came out uh, we came out the title in that sense. But yeah, it was kind of it was still kind of discomforting from a creative perspective because I usually write the story and then you know reverse engineer a, a title from that. Yeah, which is why I'm glad okay. you, you know you did this project with us, this experiment. <laughs> push yourself as well. Exactly. <laughs> no, that the only way to grow is to put yourself into. Out is to drag yourself out of your comfort zone. So I guess it's, you know. Well, we have the results out. are coming soon. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I think seems like everybody likes the title and nobody proposed any exciting, sexier <laughs> alternatives. So it's a winner, guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, we do have some quite interesting questions, but I think we will keep it for after the last poll. Okay. Um, yeah, so... The last poll is actually, it's a secret. Okay, I guess it's an open competition now between the Arts House and Tusita. <laughs> I'm neutral now. Please note that I'm neutral in this. <laughs> please, everybody in the audience, please vote for your favourite book cover. Um, actually, two of them are submitted by the Tusitala team and two of them are submitted by the Arts House team. I, I can describe them a little bit, but I don't want to be too biased. <laughs> I, like, suddenly very enthusiastic about one of them, you know? Um, yeah, so I think just, they should be... Just look at them, and whichever speaks to you, yes. just vote on that one. Yes, and then we'll tell you whether you vote. <laughs> it was Tusi Tala or the Arts House, that one. Yes, we have four options. Uh, I mean, obviously, from left to right, one, two, three, four. Just vote for what you think is the most appropriate and your favourite book cover. <laughs> I think... Along, while we're waiting for the results and for you don't don't so, please don't buy it. <laughs> no, I think people had questions about why you set this in Yishun, and uh, oh, okay. And someone even asked you to rate how terrifying Yishun is compared to <laughs> other neighborhoods from a scale of one to five. And we should all say that this was fiction. So we knew some people were upset because you had like a block that didn't exist, and we had put a visual of a general block <laughs> yes. that was like no such block in Yishun. So it's just fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think also some people. Uh, I'm not sure if y'all can do it. Y'all can actually click on the numbers on the Facebook, uh, poll function itself instead of putting it in the chat. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, this is to answer your question. I <laughs> yeah, like Yishun was. I mean, I've heard so many scary stories about Yishun. There was that website as well, right? Um, uh, the uh, 
the Ring of Fire or something. Basically, it's a website that that um, that documents all the things that happened in Yishun, from <laughs> murders to robberies to like from from like small misdemeanors to like huge, you know, um, crimes. And yeah, there have been a lot of statistically really. Um, Mission has been veering in the direction. <laughs> um, I just thought if you were a cat, you'd be a bit afraid to be. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my God, do you know that? <laughs> do you know that the that that cat murderer is my wife's sister's ex? <laughs> okay, I'm Let's just having knowledge, right? <laughs> cousin in the family of estates. <laughs> Yishun is the creepy uncle we don't want to say hi to at family <laughs> gatherings. I, I apologize to anybody who lives in Yishun who's listening in. But it's, it's you know you know what like I'm sure it will improve eventually. But for now, for as long as statistically all the bad things are happening there, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, uh yeah it's, it's true like, like she the, the cat my drug um I mean, I don't know what about what it is about Yishun that, that produces this kind of people, but and, and I know friends who are good people who are there as well. But I think I don't know something like this. There's this kind of bias, right? What is it called? You know, when you see something that is of a certain thing, then every, when the next thing happens, you just remember it. I think the whole of Singapore has this like cognitive bias towards <laughs> Yishun now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, uh, I mean, people in the in the chat, please vote on the poll itself on Facebook Live rather than in the chat function. Because if you vote on the actual uh, poll, then we'll be able to collate your answers instead of manually. La. Yeah. I think we're just waiting for a few more people to respond and then we should have the results soon. I'm quite excited because I think Pusitala is going to win. <laughs> it's not a contest, guys. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's just... It's, it's to see where everybody's creative inclinations go to work. That's it. Oh, maybe it'll be a tie. <laughs> then you have to publish both covers. <laughs> but yeah, all four. We have a clear winner. Clearly, it's Tusi Tala. Thank you, everybody. Oh. <laughs> Thank number you for one, your votes. So number two. It's not, it's, not, it's not illustrated by me, but it's illustrated <laughs> by my team, and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I thought was every cover was done very well. I thought it was very interesting to, you know, it's like how an artist interprets the story, right? So yeah. we were talking about it a little bit, you know, like uh, illustration four has a bit of like the pulp fiction, illustration one has a bit of like Twilight Zone. I felt like like book cover three had a little bit of, you know, that that very famous film with something cutting through your eye. Yeah, that was very physically discomforting. I like that. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I, I thought that had the same cover. But, but yes, thank you everybody. 55% voted for uh, book cover 2. Okay, we, we, yeah, I, I don't think it's really very nice. So I think... Which should mean? Uh, one, yeah, one more chance with should mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's design. on, guys. It's on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the end of our three questions that we are using the poll for. I think maybe now we can do as some of the questions that people have posted in the thread. And uh, please feel free to continue asking questions. Um, it will, uh, I think because we started late, maybe we'll try to end at 10.15 instead of 10. Yeah, so another 15 minutes. Um, I will maybe just pull out one of the previous questions, which I thought was quite interesting. It's from a Kama Biro. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name properly. Uh, and this question is, how do you think this project will or will not change your practice? Um, hmm, very interesting question. Uh, I love the collaborative aspect of it. Um, I mean, usually writing tends to be a very uh, introspective, very um, isolated process. Uh, and, and I can tell you that some of my, it's it's very difficult on my mental health sometimes, like to write alone because you have to exist in both in two worlds. The you know the world of real, you have to pay bills, you know, and 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 all and all that, and you have to exist 
in the world of the story that you're writing. So to, to kind of lighten that load, so to speak, it's, it's a very mental load, but oh my God, it's, it's, it's heavy sometimes. It's, it's, it, it's crippling sometimes as well. So to, to lighten some of that, that mental load to other people, um, it helps so much. It, um, you know, you, I don't feel, um, as stressed as I do when I write my novels. Uh, and my wife can attest that, like, like she, you know, there, there are days when I'm, I, I'm really just crippled. Like I cannot form a sentence, but like, it's that bad because, because my brain is just frazzled from, from, you know, being, just being divided into two worlds so much. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's a healthier, uh, writing process. That's for sure. Um, I'm, uh, like I mentioned from a screenwriter now, so, so this, this is, this is helping me in terms of the writer's room process. Um, I'm working on two TV shows, two upcoming TV shows. And, and so I, I work with a team of writers. Uh, and I think the, I, I'm one thing I really picked up that I really enjoyed uh, in this one is, is the, um, it's asking a question that's very open-ended that people just throw in their input towards, um, Case in point, uh, I think I asked about you know what I wanted the what we, what the group thinks that the main big bad should be. Uh, you know, is it a demon? Is it a ghost? Uh, and so people threw in all these different ideas about uh, about what it should be. Uh, really, of course, eventually we came out with the whole humanoid monster with many eyes. Um, but there were some very very interesting um, um, suggestions. That even if I didn't think directly, like inspired me to think in a certain direction, and and that helped so much as it is. So yeah, so I think I uh, I mean most of my novels are still written by me, so I still have to go through that process. But I think for some of some of my projects, like I will, I, I can apply a lot of the things that I learned here in in them. Yeah, and for the writers out there as well, really you guys should try it. Like it's it's. It's better for <laughs> <It's so different. laughs> Advertise, advertisement. I think, I think the interesting thing about horror is that everybody has their own experiences, right? Or they have a different exactly. culture where, where, you know, it's like the whole range of horror is so big that even if you're obviously a lover of horror, you know, you will still always be learning, I think, and everybody has their own contributions uh, that they can bring uh, to the table. Yeah, it's so fascinating to see what freaks different people out. That, that, that is very fascinating to see because... I mean, there are things that freak me out as a person, right? There are things that freak you out. So it's it, it's very nuanced. Very, there are different flavors of horror in each person, um, and, and it, it ranges from just like experiences with other people that horrifies them as to the supernatural. So I love that spectrum, and I was exposed to that spectrum uh, in this process. So I, I really appreciate. It. Hmm. I think uh, maybe now we should uh, ask the audience if they have any other questions, but maybe to move a bit slightly away from horror, I'll ask you another question by uh, Sarah Ruslan. Ruslan? Uh, so she asks, would you do a romance next? There are so many <laughs> murder mystery events right, out there. So is this actually, would Sufyan write a uh, romance next? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, is it, are you asking... Um, the, the, the people who are doing the project, like Lisa and I, whether we're going to get a romance writer, or are you asking Sufyan to write a romance? <laughs> Please clarify in the chat. Is there a romance writer in Singapore? Uh, there not are. A genre, uh, not a genre writer, right? but there are people who write. Yeah, love stories. Uh, I mean, there, I think there are some writers who kind of write what would you, you would call chick lit, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, not... Actually, when, when Lisa and I were talking about this project, to mm. me, romance is such an obvious uh, crowdsource thing, you know? So everybody has their perspective on what is romantic, everybody has their perspective on if if a guy has to choose between a girl, these two girls, who should he choose? Everybody feels so strongly about it, right? So, yeah. Okay, so Sarah has just clarified, she said both. Okay. So, I think we, I, I can answer yeah. on the, the Tusitala and the arts house side, la, which is yes, I personally would love to do something like that. <laughs> I would love to see how everybody's expectations and values are suddenly projected onto this poor writer's story. <laughs> we'll have to bear the weight of these expectations. 
<laughs> I mean, dating sims are like this huge like industry also, right? Outside in the in the video game industry, and there's a reason uh, why people feel so strongly about the choices that people make in their romantic lives. I think. <laughs> yeah, but Sophia, now is the the question is for you. Uh, are you gonna consider writing a romance? I would incorporate romance. Um. Okay, I personally don't see it as a genre, so to speak, but I will incorporate romance into my novels. Um, uh, for example, in my second novel, The Minorities, um, shameless plug, <laughs> uh, um, there is a, a semblance of romance between the protagonist and the Pontianak that he is helping. So, you know, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd ever be a genre writer, so to speak, but uh, I will incorporate it into my stories. Yeah, so okay, I mean, okay. I just want to remind everyone as well that, um, I mean, we got the green light to do this experiment really for two months, so with two writers, and if there are writers who kind of really want to embark on this with us, with their chosen genre, or you guys are really excited about it and you want to come back, definitely let us know in the chats as well, so, because if there is demand, then we will deliver. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also email Lisa, Lisa at thearthouse.com. <laughs> that's not my email. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure if that's your real email. <laughs> <laughs> we got another question from Glenn Huang. He's asking, I think it should be towards Sufyan. What is your most horrifying encounter with spirits to date? Ooh, good question. Um, okay, so I I uh, <laughs> I have never had um a direct encounter, but I have been in the direct presence of people who are having direct encounters. Having, you mean like in real time? Yeah, so like for example, when I was in the army, um, there was this guy, uh, okay, so I'm filtering out all the, all the people who are, to me, attention seekers or whatever, who tell me that they see ghosts, or who I don't think are right in the mind, okay? So I filter those stories out because I've, I've had a lot of those, okay? People who, people who are like attention seekers and say, oh my god, there's a ghost there, I don't see anything. Oh, so these are these are accounts from people who I think are reliable, who are intelligent people, uh, and who are not the kind of people uh, who do not have the kind of personalities that uh, in which they need to like you know oh my god look at me I see a ghost so all those out okay um, so the first one was when I was cycling with a group of friends along the old Tampines Road and one of my friends uh, who is actually our leader cycling leader, um, he sees a woman sitting on top of, so you know along old uh, Tampines Road, this was in 2013, um, they had those old orange and white bus stops, right? So he saw a woman sitting on top of it, and he told us to cycle faster, and when we were going to cycle back, so we were cycling out to football, and then we were cycle back to, uh, we stayed in the east, so it's faster race for me, like he said that we should all just take a grab home, rather than cycle back the same way. Um, because the only other way home would be through the expressways and you can't cycle the expressways. Um, yeah, so that was one. Uh, in army, when I was doing, when I was leading guard duty, um, also there was one uh, person talking about um, a woman with long hair in white sitting on top of the, uh, we had a barrier that, that leads into our camp, so she's just sitting on top of it, which is a very precarious situation for, for a ghost to sit on. Because you know you can all of balance anytime, but hey, you know. Um, and then the final time was when I needed to pee so bad that I peed on a tree. Okay, and did I know, you, did I you know, say excuse me? No, I did not. No, I did not. So like, I was like, so this was this was me being you know, um, this was me imposing my privilege on whatever tree spirits there were because like I needed to pee. God damn it! I'll pee now. I won't ask for excuse. <laughs> so so I did and then uh, after being uh, walked away my friend walks very urgently to me holds up his hand and says he did not know any better he did not know any better to something behind me he just did that she just walked past me and said he did not know any better he did not know any, he did not know so like I was like whoa what the f <laughs> yeah so um, okay. okay yeah so I, I've never seen I've never seen anything but I've been in that you know Right. I've been in those situations. You've been in the presence of something. I guess, yeah. I mean, I kind of regret my Zoom wallpaper now, by the way. <laughs> 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 and just to clarify, earlier on, my my makeup is actually a Snapchat filter. 
She's not an actual vampire just to be like <laughs> Yes, I'm not an actual vampire. I can I can go out in the day, I can eat garlic, I love garlic. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one last question to, to close the session. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a question from Crystal. She's saying as somebody who is not a fan of horror, I think she's referring to herself, can you explain how the genre sets itself apart from other genres? Or maybe how it de- delivers the same message differently? Okay. Um, so the horror that I like, I mean, there are, you have many kinds of horror. So, um, uh, and, you know, from slasher films to body horror um the kind of horror that i like is the um is those that package the horror um as um as an author's as a very deep author's message what do i mean by this okay so for example the the george romero zombie movies okay um the george romero zombie movies the zombies were always a metaphor um for something that was pervading society at the time, um, it was actually the eighties. So, um, so, so for example, things like in um, in Land of the Dead. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, there is just one human stronghold surrounded by zombies. So, surrounded by surrounded by a river, and on the other side of the river, there are zombies. Um, and what they do is that um, uh, they will put fireworks in the, they'll, they'll throw fireworks. When, so when they want to like loot other places, they'll throw fireworks. So the zombies are just staring up at the fireworks and then they'll go and loot everything. Um, so it's a, it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor for, you know, for the spectacle of the media slash entertainment industry, how we are just zombies staring up at the, at the lights in the sky so that the people in power can come and take our stuff. Um, but at the same time, eventually the zombies actually kind of just like, um, I mean, they're still, um, they're still mindless, but they, they rally around one leader, um, who's a, who just happens to be a, a black, a Negro zombie who, um, you know, who leads them across the river. So it's very Moses in that sense, <laughs> across the river and they take over the city. Um, so yeah, so, so it's, it's, you know, um, it's, that's a political message right there. Um, things like the haunting of Hill House, you know, the ghosts are representatives of their, the family's trauma. Um, you know, the, the ghosts aren't just ghosts for the sake of jump scares, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, they they are specific, their horrors are specifically designed to represent um, each character's trauma. Um, and I think that's fantastic. So for me, the kind of ghost stories that I like um, and how these ghost stories stand out is when they package a deeper message into the horror. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure Freud will have a lot of things to say about, you know, like the subconscious <laughs> of our human nature and things like that. And one thing that has always fascinated me is why is it that a lot of the ghosts are women and a lot of the monsters are men? Yeah, um, so... I mean, we can have a separate discussion about right, yeah. I mean, sorry, yeah, just, just... Everyone is wearing white and has long hair. <laughs> yes, like, yeah. why? <laughs> Well, I mean, there's the trope of the monstrous feminine, uh, that's yes, the yes. In, you know, in, in, in uh, literary uh, analysis. So, um, well, that's for you guys to read. Sorry. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, so actually, it's it's ten ten. We've kind of run a little bit late, but we also started late because we had, had some tech issues. So I think uh, uh, we'll just like close it off. Thanks, Sufyan, for being such a good spot. I think Lisa <laughs> and I and the whole Tushitala and Arts House team really enjoy working with Sufyan. Yeah. Uh, and we really like, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, right, to be the first person in this rather kind of strange <laughs> <laughs> well, experiment. I mean, but it's nice because I love experimenting, so we're really like figuring things out as things went along. Which was yeah, and I think we, we changed a lot of things along the way and we, you know, we had to be quite flexible and things like that. So I think we really appreciate you uh, being so on with us. And I really love the story also, like, it's like really just waiting. Every Friday, Sufya is going to give me this amazing story. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, so thanks so much. Um, no problem. Thank you. Uh, I think you, you will still stay here, but I think we'll Lisa and I will just take the next five minutes to do a shameless plug for our next writer, <laughs> who is also I think watching us live. Yes. Um. So Sia Shim is an award winning writer who lives in a book fort. Mm-hmm. Her first book, Dragon Hearted, was shortlisted for the Scholastic Asian Book Award in twenty fourteen and was published in twenty sixteen. It was also shortlisted for the Singapore Book Awards in 2017 and won the Hedwig Anwar Children's Book Prize. 
in 2018. So I think what we're going to do now is audience members, you have one last poll to do. We actually have two options for you and we would like you to choose which story Shumin should write in the next four weeks. Please vote wisely. <laughs> and make your vote count. <laughs> okay, so um, it might be a bit small, but uh, I think both of them are kind of... Uh, would you say it's fantasy, Lisa? Would you say it's fantasy? Yeah, maybe a little bit more. So it's uh, definitely uh, different from Sufyan's. Um, and that's what we were going for as well, to have a different genre. So I hope everybody can read and it's not too small. Yeah, so maybe I should I just read it out? Story 1. Um, Huang Jia Jun's girlfriend has just passed away. Unable to imagine his life without her, he asked the Lord of the Dead to bring her back to life. But the Lord of the Dead's price is steep. Will Jia Jun succeed in bringing his girlfriend back, or does life and death, or does life and death have other plans for him? Story two: Fifteen-year-old uh, Yu Xuan has the has had to hide the secret her entire life. She's one of the dragon princesses of the South Seas. This this like warms the cockles of my heart because like <laughs> I watch a lot of Channel 8 drama growing up. You're influencing again. <laughs> but she isn't just hiding her true self from schoolmates and, and teachers, but also from the grand patriarch of her estranged family, the Dragon King himself. To make matters worse, the most popular girl at school, Jamie, thinks she's hiding something. Can Yu Xian keep her secret? And if she can't, are her peers willing to accept her for who she is? So, Sophia, you, you can vote. <laughs> she means, well. yes, you can yeah. vote for which idea you want also. But you only have one vote as yeah. for a regular democracy. <laughs> yeah, so. Sorry for the, the squeaky line under your name. <laughs> okay, so everyone who's watching this um, vote in the Facebook poll function itself. Yeah, so just to let everyone know that if you have any other um, feedback or suggestions for us, please feel free to email us at programs at artshouse.sg. Um, and we really hope that you will be part of this round that we have with Shimin. And you please follow our social medias uh, so that you can get the notifications of when she's going to do her live sessions, which we haven't decided if it's going to be Facebook or... Facebook AMA or Facebook Live yet. And if you have a preference, if you prefer to see the writer live every week for this process or just doing messaging on Facebook Live, um, Facebook AMA Live kind of thing, um, do let us know as well. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever story that you guys vote for, you'll see the first chapter by this Thursday. Mm. And then we'll also have the live session on Thursday night uh, at 9 p.m. But you can also let us know if you prefer it to be like a video like this or like a, like yeah. Lisa said, just a, a online. Just a chat, yeah. Chat, yeah. Okay, yeah, the boat's in. <laughs> okay, yes, please. Uh, let's go live with the results. Quite excited. I think she should have switched off on this head in the seat right now. Uh, should be has been like, thanks to Sufyan for doing it first and ironing yeah. out the kings. Yes, yes. <laughs> Problem. <laughs> okay, so uh, it was very tight, Ooh. but it seems like uh, story one has won by just one vote. Wow! <laughs> one vote. Oh my god! That's why, guys, you know, make a vote count is very important. But yes, I would love to see Yan Luo Wang. Can you imagine the uh, Yan Luo Wang, a uh, uh, lot of the date that's like you know, like Sang Nila Utama is like very hot now, right? Because of our uh, there's this comic, you know. You know what? How, how, how can we make this Yan Luo Wang interesting? Like, you know, maybe he's like a K-pop star. I don't know. <laughs> Reimagine our, you know. Yeah. Okay, uh, so thanks I very think, much. Yeah, uh, thanks the story will come out. Uh, should mean you're there, right? So yeah. please write the story. <laughs> yeah, you can get started now or tomorrow morning. Yeah, we'll find both ways. Oh. <laughs> now. <laughs> So advice from Sufan is to start tonight. And hopefully we'll see all of you again on Thursday. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you again, Sufian, for actually being part of this as well. Thank you for having me. We're looking forward, uh, Shumin, to see what you're going to cook up in yeah. the coming few days. Uh, thank you and good night, everyone. Have a great week ahead. Thank you.